Abdul Kareem from OGN. And tonight we have a very, very special interview for you. But before we get started and talk about that, uh, we're letting everybody know that we're broadcasting live from uh, northern Syria. We're on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube. So do take uh, a minute, take the link, paste it into your WhatsApp or your YouTube, or I should say your uh, Telegram accounts, and send it to anybody that you think might be able to benefit from our interview that we're going to have here today. Okay, we're going to be interviewing live uh, sister Yvonne Ridley, who is uh, a journalist, an author, uh, an activist, and she just came back from Afghanistan, and we're gonna be looking forward to uh, speaking to her about her trip. So let's get started with first by saying assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh to you, Sister Yvonne. How are you? Walaikum salam. Uh, yes, alhamdulillah, I'm uh, fine, Bilal. Uh, everything is uh, is good, yes. All right. Uh, Sister Yvonne. Uh, first of all, when did you uh, arrive back in town from Afghanistan? Um, just yesterday. Um, I've still got the dust of Kandahar and Kabul on my boots. Okay. Um, so let's just get started with the basics. Why did you go to Afghanistan? What, did, what, was, uh, what was it that you were looking for? Um, well, the, the reason I went this time was to try and meet the education minister and other uh, ministers in the Taliban to find out why they appeared to have reversed a decision on senior girls' education. And I wanted them to tell me because some of the reports coming out of Afghanistan have uh, not rang true. And I think that there's growing distrust of the mainstream media and its handling of matters coming out of Afghanistan. There seems to be a one dimensional agenda, which is uh, Taliban are bad and, uh, and every bad thing that's happening in Afghanistan is their fault. So I wasn't convinced by this narrative, so I wanted to go and see for myself, you know, what is happening on the ground there. Well, you went and you saw. Um, are things as advertised that they've reversed their decision to, for the girls to go to school? Um, what did you see firsthand? Well, frustratingly, I felt that the Taliban were playing around with words and they were saying that they hadn't banned uh, senior girls from school. They had merely postponed the reopening of uh, the senior girls school. And, you know, whichever way they were trying to spin it, I said it wasn't good enough and that they needed to roll out this education program for the senior girls and i pointed out that you know through my experience um, as a captive of the taliban that set me on a course to study islam which then turned into a spiritual journey and I pointed out that one of the first things that I learned was that uh, the first uh, verse from the Quran that was delivered was um, Ikra, the instruction to read. And I, you know, said that this was very, very important and showed the importance of education and knowledge. And it didn't say read. Uh, men only, um, it said, read as into everyone. And it was a bit like knocking on an open door. The education minister agreed and uh, said that he believed that uh, 
boys and girls had equal rights when it came to education and that there should be no difference so it, it um and this was what i also got from the defense minister the interior minister um well every minister that i met um, what every uh governor that i met you know from uh kuna province logar province uh everywhere that i went people were saying the same thing so i was wondering you know where the blockage is coming from is are, are their words matching their deeds are they what are their words matching their deeds in other words they're saying okay. that mm -hmm. uh we don't have a problem with girls continuing higher education there's no problem in this regard but were you seeing that on the ground well um the ministers that i spoke to uh seemed really sincere in their belief that the senior girls should go back to to school um and they said it will happen soon um but trying to pin the taliban down to what soon means uh was very difficult you know it was like trying to nail jelly to the wall it could have meant weeks it could it could mean months um you know i just couldn't get anyone to specifically say what soon was but what i did discover um although i didn't discover that their identities is that there are two or three really old uh, scholars out there who um are resistant to senior education and these are scholars who were in afghanistan uh, before the soviet invasion and they saw secular education being rolled out then they saw young people rise up and and uh, the fall of the monarchy happened and I right. think that the scholars blamed education uh, for that and don't want to see a repeat happening today, which is an absolute nonsense. But um, that, uh, that seemed to be the, um, the, the stumbling block, these two or three scholars. But, you know, um, the strength of the Taliban is also their weakness. They will not break ranks and criticize each other, which, which is good. Um, you know, they're totally solid and united. Um, so although 95% of them believe that uh, women should be educated at all levels, they won't out the resistant quarter that uh or five percent that um that don't want to see this happen um no. so uh, they're just... they're holding rank you know and, mm. and that they are um united as one um and publicly but privately i think they're knocking seven bells out of each other until they can get this issue resolved they know that they have to deliver on this um, the only other problem that they have is that there are elements out in the rural area where they got most of their support from, um, but there are elements out there that don't believe that girls should even leave the house, never mind go to school and be educated. And that is a cultural issue, nothing to do with the Taliban or their mm -hmm. ideology. It's a cultural issue, you know, as I keep telling people, the Afghan culture has been around for centuries, whereas the Taliban have just been around since the 90s. So they now have to try and, and persuade their constituent uh, support that mm -hmm. uh, girls should be allowed to go to school. Um, the good news is that about 16 of the 34 provinces um, are totally ignoring 
the postponement of, of senior girls' education. Mm -hmm. And so in these um, provinces, girls are going to school at, at all levels. Um, girls who are in private education, uh, where the parents are paying fees for their education, they're all going to school as mm -hmm. well. So the ones that aren't going to school um, are from about um, 16 to 18 provinces. Mm -hmm. um, now, somebody might be watching this right now and then mm -hmm. say, um, look, we need to give them a chance to deliver on their promises. Some people would also say, look, we've already given them a chance. These people are not what we thought that they were, and we need to look for alternatives. Where are you in this, in that debate, I guess mm. we would say? Well, I told them, I told the education minister, this is not happening quickly enough, and it needs to be rolled out um, as, as soon as possible. And uh, he said it will be rolled out soon. And that's when we got into the whole business of how long is soon. <laughs> um, I left them in, in absolutely no doubt that it wasn't happening quickly enough, that uh, people had uh, lost trust in uh, the promises that they rolled out at that uh, famous press conference last August. And they, they are acutely aware of this. And they kept, in Kabul anyway, they kept saying to me, it will happen, it will happen, please be patient. Um, there's an announcement coming soon. Uh, one told me that um, he thought that an announcement would be made around Eid. Um, another one showed me a photograph of his 10-year-old daughter and said, she wants to become a doctor. Right. And mm -hmm. I have promised I will do everything in my power to make sure she gets the education that will en enable that to happen. So it's like pushing against an open door. It's just this tiny little cabal of fossils that um, need to uh, get with the project. And, and uh, so, you know, Everybody was assuring me it, it it will happen. It is going to happen. And then about, they would say soon. <laughs> what about the financial sector? Um, we're seeing a lot of uh, poverty, widespread poverty and such like that. Um, is that what you're seeing on the ground as well? What's the economy, uh, economic situation look like? Well, before the Taliban arrived, Afghanistan was a country that was dependent uh, very much on aid. I think 75% of the GDP came um, from uh, the aid sector. It didn't change uh, when the Taliban took power. But of course, what did change was that um, on the upside, the corrupt government, which had been pocketing all the people's money, um, has gone. On the downside, the international community led by America have frozen all the assets and the banks. And so I was in this bizarre situation where I couldn't use the cash points. The cash points don't work. The banks are closed. Um, things that uh, I take for granted, like going on uh, online and ordering something with the click of a button and, and using my card, um, that didn't work. Mm -hmm. uh, so it, it really is, you know, cash is king there. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately there, there is no cash at the moment um because the assets are frozen the banks are closed and even um western ngos aren't able to pay the salary um of their own staff uh, by simple bank transfer you know just 
uh, I was going to say if you can imagine it, but then of course you're living in a in a war zone as well, where it's not that easy to get an appointment with the bank manager or you know all the things right. that that we take uh, for granted in the in the West. So. Um, what Joe Biden has done, the US president has done um, by freezing billions of dollars of assets that belong to the Afghan people, what Biden has done is uh, consigned at least one million children under the age of five uh, to slowly starve to death. Okay. Um, you know, the, the, and this isn't me saying it. This is uh, mm. UNICEF um, that is saying mm. that the, the, this uh, malnutrition, um, it, it will lead to a million deaths unless something can be done um, to put food on the table. Are there enough NGOs operating on the ground there or are they not operating? Um, Very few think? are operating. Um, the I, I think that the majority have, uh, because of these sanctions, um, are unable to function um, in Afghanistan. Uh, there are very few uh, NGOs that the Taliban have approved. Uh, to operate on the ground. So it, it really is a dire uh, situation that uh, you know, is, is unfolding. And of course, um, this is America's second stage of the war. Um, and I call it economic warfare. And, uh, you know, there's no question that America was trounced by the Taliban, 20 year war, and these uh, these men in their flip flops and shalwa kameez saw off the greatest superpower in the world. And, uh, you know, they won, the Americans lost, and the Americans don't like losing, although you'd think that they would have got used to it by now, uh, because most of the conflicts that they enter into end up in um, in, in treaties or, uh, or or a retreat, as in Saigon and Vietnam mm -hmm. and all of, all of that, Iraq. And, and Iraq. You know, they retreated from Iraq mm -hmm. as well. So, B being that the NGOs are not uh, able or willing to service the people in Afghanistan and that there is widespread poverty, what effect does that have on the popular support of the Taliban amongst the common Afghan? Um, the Afghan people are, are very stoic. You know, that they, uh, they can see what is happening. Uh, they have learned that the international community um, isn't reliable and they're, they're very much, you know, this is the will of Allah and the, the only Afghans who are in absolute denial and, and spitting feathers are the uh, English-speaking elite who fled Afghanistan uh, with the Americans and the other uh, NATO forces. And uh, they are sitting from afar, um, absolutely fizzing that the Taliban are now ruling because they just never thought it would happen. But you see, the, the elite were living in this bubble with this hugely corrupt government mm -hmm. and what they weren't told and what we weren't told by the media um, was that the Taliban was running a parallel government in the south and had been for nearly 10 years. So when commentators were saying, oh, the Taliban, you know, they've swept in, they've, they've taken, uh, they're coming into Kabul, 
it was a big shock to all of them because uh, they never imagined that the Taliban would uh, would win this war. And, you know, statistically, uh, there was about 70,000, 75,000 Taliban poorly equipped, uh, wearing, you know, shalwa kameez um, and, and flip-flops. And they were fighting uh, after the the U.S. forces, but they were also fighting this um, high tech, high powered uh, Afghan National Army that had the top kit, um, armor plating, and and uh, uh, top weapons, and they defeated matter. them. Mm -hmm. And that came as a as a shock. Um, why it came as a shock, I've got no idea, because I think the biggest clue happened in uh, February 2020 or 2021 when they, they signed the Doha Agreement right. between America and the Taliban. And that should have been the biggest clue that America was going to... Uh, quit and run, right? And and uh, nobody seemed to see it coming. Well, uh, I've got a question here that came from um, our audience, and I think it's very relevant, and I'd like for you to answer it. Um, it's from Yusuf El Baroudi, who says, um, "Ivan, what do you think will be the attitude of the current Pakistan government?" towards Afghanistan now that a new prime minister is in charge? Well, if Yusuf had asked me that question two weeks ago, I would have been brimming with optimism and saying that uh, I think that um, Imran Khan would really make um, an overture and, and uh, solidify really good relations with Kabul, between Kabul and Islamabad. Um, Imran Khan, uh, you know, I'm not given to conspiracy theories, but when Imran Khan said that uh, his uh, leadership was being destabilized by America, I believed him. Um, I've interviewed Imran Khan a few times. He's not given to histrionics or hysteria or, you know, he doesn't buy into conspiracy theories. He's a very level-headed uh, leader and for him to say this it's quite obvious um, that he had good reason now I've looked into some of his recent speeches and last year he was asked you know with all this peace breaking um, out in Afghanistan with America leaving with uh, the, the Taliban uh, taking over, um, he was asked, you know, the Americans will still want a foothold in the region because they need to keep an eye on Iran, a traditional enemy. Um, they need to keep an eye on Afghanistan. So isn't it likely that they will want to use all of the military bases along that great big porous border between Afghanistan and Pakistan um, and uh, he was asked you know will you be allowing uh, the American military to use Pakistan military bases and he said two words absolutely not that will not have endeared him to Washington Washington needs a foothold in that area it's got Russia in there, Iran, Afghanistan. It needs a foothold. Right. And uh, Pakistan is the, the likely country. And Imran Khan, he's not anti-West. His, his sons are, are living in uh, Britain. Um, he's not anti-Western at all. But what he has been wanting to do is to distance and uh, distance Pakistan from uh, reliance upon the West, because right. as any uh, 
previous friend of the the west will tell you you know we are very fickle friends and um, you um, know saddam hussein could tell you that if he was still alive the same with um gaddafi uh the same with the kurds the kurds have been shafted by america on many occasions so um he's distanced pakistan from washington and he's moving more towards R russia and china right which trading wise makes sense you know they're in the region and uh, pakistan and afghanistan are right on that silk road route that uh, beijing has been eyeing up for a long time and so it, it makes sense and this is uh, america does not want uh, that to happen so it's quite possible that they have set about to destabilize his uh, his position and um, let me i'm sorry let me just jump in here and and all because i think there's a good uh question here that i I'd really like to know what your thoughts are. Uh, Taji Mustafa says, criminal that kids are starving in Afghanistan while Muslim countries nearby have wealth. Muslims everywhere should be demanding aid is sent from Muslim countries. That is an Islamic duty upon us all. Why aren't Muslim countries sending aid to Afghanistan? As a state, I'm not talking about individual citizens, mm -hmm. I'm talking about as a state. Well, uh, funnily enough, while I was out there, the OIC was holding a meeting, so maybe um, that will change. But it's something that uh, should have been happening from last August. Uh, and and uh, but we, you know, we know that um, a lot of these Muslim countries, uh, the spirit of brotherhood, the concept of Ummah is completely alien to them um these rulers it's all about uh about their power and influence and and less to do with um the concept of the um the the spirit of uh, brotherhood what are you expecting to come next from afghanistan um are you expecting good things to come? Are they just completely wracked by financial issues? So don't expect anything anytime soon. What was the spirit on the ground? Well, you know, life has always been hard in Afghanistan, certainly in the last 50 years. So the ordinary Afghan people are no stranger to hardship. And uh, as I say, 75% of the GDP was provided uh, through aid. So what, what do I think will happen next? I would love to think that the international community will get off its high horse and, and recognize the Taliban government. Um, the way that America has launched its economic warfare makes it virtually impossible for the Taliban to perform. They're being set up to fail. Um, you know, it's like putting a ball and chain on somebody's leg and then telling them to run. And then when they can't run, blame them uh, for, for not being able to overcome the ball and chain. Um, America has set them up to fail with all these uh, brutal economic sanctions. And uh, I think that, that many people can, can see that. What seems to have um, bypassed most people is that uh, when you speak to ordinary Afghans in the countryside, in the rural areas, uh, virtually everyone has had a negative um, encounter with the US occupation. 
Sure. Women who've lost husbands, who've lost sons, um, who've lost fathers. And, you know, they have really large families. And if you upset one Afghan, you can virtually count on really upsetting 50 more. And, mm -hmm. and you know, you, you look at the thousands that have uh, suffered at the hands of the U.S. occupation and then times that by 50 and you start to realize the enormous negative impact that the occupation has had. And, you know, as I said to somebody the other day, just because an Afghan woman doesn't uh, have a playlist and watch Netflix and, and uh, ha has the, the latest uh, Apple iPhone, it doesn't mean that her thoughts or opinions or views are worth anything less than uh, maybe her counterpart living in, uh, in the cities. So uh, really the, the animosity held towards the US occupation is, is very, very strong. So I don't think that the goodwill that the Taliban have got at the moment will be frittered away um, anytime soon. And, you know, when you've got nothing, when you're virtually homeless and, and have no food on the table, it's very difficult to take anything else away. So this uh, economic warfare right. isn't really affecting too many afghans because you know how do you how how can you take anything away from somebody who's got nothing but now speaking of economic warfare um everybody knows the difficulties that the afghans are facing financially but the taliban have taken the step uh towards banning the poppy seed uh uh uh, uh uh, the growing of the of, of the poppy seed, which is used for heroin, um, Afghanistan supplies um, a very large portion of the heroin found around the world. Um, was this the right time to do that? Is that effective um, on the ground, or are they meeting a lot of resistance? Um, well, it was too early to say because I, I was there when they made the announcement about uh, banning the opium crops. Um, obviously, it will have an impact on the Afghan versions of Pablo Escobar. Um, but I think that uh, it will just affect um, a few warlord type of individuals who've traded in uh, in these drugs for many years the afghan farmers the the poppy growers they might be pretty annoyed because uh it's an incredibly easy crop to grow and you can get two crops in a year and it's not that labor intensive so um the farmers might be disenchanted, but um, you know maybe they'll be given another incentive. The real impact is going to be felt in the West. And I have spoken to a few politicians in Scotland about this because Scotland has quite a serious drug problem. And I said, drug prices are going to shoot up, which means that crime will escalate right. and, and uh, this is going to have a really negative impact um, in the West. Right. And I think it'll have more of an impact in the West than it actually will in Afghanistan. But, you know, when the Taliban um, were in power in the 90s, they reduced the reliance um, or reduced the crops um, in Afghanistan and had virtually eradicated the problem by 2000. Right. Um, let me just jump in here. Um, a lot of people, when they think of 
uh, Sister Yvonne Ridley, uh, they think of journalist, author, but there's also the activist side of you. Um, maybe a lot of people don't know that um, you were close to brokering a, uh, uh, a deal via Pakistan um, and the U.S. authorities regarding uh, Dr. Afia Siddiqui. Um, unfortunately, at the last minute, the deal was scuttled. But I'm bringing this up now because I want to ask you, you've just come back from Afghanistan, you've seen the situation there, you understand the geopolitical uh, 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 games which are being played. What's next for you? Are you planning to um, basically uh, talk to some of the uh, Muslim capitals to see if there's something that can be done for them? Um, what are your plans going forward? Um, I will be going back to Afghanistan in uh, June. And, um, you know, I can nag for Britain. I've made it an Olympian, uh, <laughs> if it was an Olympian event, I'd be a gold medalist. I will be going back. And if uh, the girls' schools aren't um, opened or reopened by the time I get back, I will really um, nag for Britain um, over this uh, issue. Um, I think that it's important that we give the Taliban as much um, support, practical support in terms of aid. And I'll be working over the next few weeks to um, help. Uh, there is a charity on the ground, a British charity called the al -Khair Foundation. I think it's uh, it, it's also on the ground in uh, northern Syria, mm -hmm. and um, they want to unveil a very ambitious school building program. And they were quite clear when in our meetings that uh, that we held with all of these government ministers that this really ambitious uh, school program, rebuilding program, is very much dependent on girls' education right. and, and uh, getting, you know, the girls back to school. So that's, uh, that's something that, you know, one of the reasons that I will be returning. And um, I think at the moment, at least five of the schools um, have now, the money has now been pledged uh, by uh, different groups. Right. So, and that's just in, in, you know, less than a week that that, that has happened. And I expect that uh, by the time the fundraising has finished from our care, I, I expect that, uh, we will be ready in a position to start building these 10 new schools. Um, some of the areas that we went to, um, I, I was down in a place called Spin Baldock, which is on the Pakistan border um, in the, uh, one of the mo more remote areas in Kandahar. And we're going to build a school there, inshallah. And the, the village that we picked is a place called Nawa, which is, has a little bracelet of about seven or eight villages and, and about 50 homes in each village. Right. And the one shortage that Afghanistan doesn't have is children. And there are 2,000 children in Spin Baldock in this area called Nawa that um, have never been educated. They've got no schools. Um, they have no idea what it's like to, to go into a formal education. So these are the, um, the kids that we really want to focus on. And 
this is something again that the Western media overlooks. You know, they speak to um, highly educated uh, English speaking elite in the cities like Herat and, and uh, Kabul. And that, that's just a tiny sort of percentage of Afghans. There are four million Afghan children who have no idea what the inside of a classroom looks like. Right. So, um, we have to uh, get ready to wrap this up, but I want to wrap it up with a very interesting uh, comment here that uh, Taji Mustafa made. Um, uh, again, I want to bring this up here and get your thoughts on it. He says, the Taliban should reach out to the Muslims globally to help them. We have Muslim experts in many fields and are ready to help. They mustn't make the mistake of making this an Afghan issue. Is that what they're doing? They're making this an Afghan issue. Are they open to um, help from the Muslim world? Uh, I'm, of course, we're talking about sincere help. Um, what are your thoughts about that? The one thing the Taliban will not do is compromise in any way on their Islam. So I think that they've got more chance of agreeing to or accepting help from the Muslim world than, uh, than say, from the West. Um, but also, historically, uh, what Muslims must realize is that the Taliban have never had ambitions beyond Afghanistan's borders. Um, they may they've not never uh, they've never taken their fight uh, for independence beyond their borders. Now they may have never taken outside of their borders, but are they willing to um, uh, accept uh, an influx of technocrats from around the the Muslim world to come in? to live amongst them and to help them? Are, are, are you getting the impression that they are uh, flexible to that? Um, it would be very much on their terms. And as they once said to me, and it, it seems to be repeated at the moment, um, when the Arabs came to their country, they came as their guests, but very soon turned into their masters or tried to become their masters. And I don't think that they, uh, the Taliban will allow that to happen again. Mm -hmm. um, they made a lot of mistakes in the 90s. And I don't think that they will make those same mistakes again. So I think that um, anyone coming to their country, I think they would be made most welcome. There has been a real brain drain. And so I think that they would welcome um, a reverse of that. And, and uh, But I think it would be very much on their terms um where they would retain uh control uh, finally you made mention that you are trying to build uh some schools there in afghanistan is there a way that someone could contribute because we have people who are asking this question um is there some uh, charity organization or such like that if they'd like to contribute to that how can they do it um, go on to the website of the Alcare Foundation and... Uh, Can you give us that, uh, that uh, address? Um, A-L-K-H-A-I-R, I think it's dot .org, O-R-G. Um, but it, it, uh, it, uh, it's based in London. But it operate, it's the third largest Muslim charity um, in Britain. Mm -hmm. And what I like about it is that it's incredibly transparent. Right. So if you give 
um, ten pounds. Uh, you can follow that donation through to the to its conclusion. Okay. All right. Well, we're going to have to leave it there. Um, we want to thank you, thank our guests, uh, Dr. Yvonne Ridley, who just came back from Afghanistan, for helping us to understand these nuances in terms of what's been going on there on the ground. Uh, Dr. Yvonne, we want to thank you, uh, and um, hopefully you'll come back uh, when you go back again. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you so much for inviting me and, and solidarity to you and yours out in Syria. Jazaki uh, I am Bilal Abdul Karim for OGN here in northern Syria. Jazakum Allahu Khaira. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa